Now the next classifications of shock I want to look at are sometimes described as distributive shock, meaning the blood is in the wrong place. It's not a term I like particularly. But the common feature of these three types of shock is that there is a loss of vasomotor tone and a peripheral vasodilation. The peripheral vessels are allowed to relax. That reduces peripheral resistance and of course that reduces blood pressure. And the first one to look at is, is septic shock. Now, sepsis is quite common. Um, we get it all the time. It's basically whenever you've got an infection. And the surviving sepsis campaign guidelines tell us that we should consider that someone becomes septic if their temperature reaches 38.3 degrees centigrade. So there's a, an increase in body temperature. And typically, the heart rate will increase to over 90 beats per minute. Now, this obviously depends on the age of the patient. In children, the heart's going to be beating much faster. In athletes, young, fit people, the heart might be beating slower. But in most patients, the heart rate is going to go faster because to generate a fever, if the, if the body temperature is 38.3, that requires quite a lot of extra metabolic activity to generate that temperature because the immune system is going to work better at these pyrexial temperatures, so it's worth generating it. But then the heart has to work harder to get more oxygen to, to the metabolizing tissues to raise the body temperature. And also, typically, there's going to be an increase in respiratory rate, a tachypnea, increased respiratory rate. And this might be above 20 respirations per minute. And it's actually quite interesting that a lot of new research is showing that one of the first features that indicates someone is becoming ill is that their respiratory rate increases. So a very important clinical observation. So we should be observing for temperature, heart rate, and of course, um, breathing rate. And also the surviving sepsis campaign guidelines suggest that there will be a leukocytosis of above 12,000, an increase in the number of white cells present in the blood. So um, fever, tachycardia, tachypnea, and leukocytosis, indicating sepsis. But of course, we get this quite commonly. If you get a bad chest infection, or a gastroenteritis, or, or a cystitis, any infection can cause th these clinical features of, of sepsis. And if this happens, but there's no complications, we call this uncomplicated sepsis. And most times, you'll be ill for a few days, you'll get better, you'll convalesce for a few days, and then you'll go back to work. It's uncomplicated. But sepsis can be more serious, and there's another classification called severe sepsis. Now, you'll still have the clinical features of sepsis, but the difference is in severe sepsis, there will be one or more organ failures as a result of the sepsis. So there may be renal failure, there may be pulmonary failure. So uncomplicated, are the clinical features of infection. Without complications, all the organs are still working properly. Severe sepsis, one or more organ dysfunction. But then as well as that, there can be septic shock. And this is where the sepsis has caused vasodilation, as well as causing vasodilation, when the blood vessels dilate, they become more permeable. So there can be a hypovolemic component to this as well. And if this happens to such an extent that the patient's tissues are inadequately perfused and inadequately oxygenated, this will be defined as a septic shock. Now, classically, it's been thought of that shock is caused by, septic shock is caused by infection with gram-negative organisms. Because when gram-negative organisms die, there are chemicals in their cell wall that are released, and these are very inflammatory. They cause the release of a lot of cytokines, and they cause a severe inflammatory reaction. So gram-negative organisms, E. coli, for example, from the gut, certainly can cause sepsis. But also, there's another classification called toxic shock syndrome. And this is different in that it's caused by gram-positive organisms. Most commonly, Staphylococcus, but also Streptococcus. And these release exotoxins when they're alive. 
And these exotoxins from these particular strains of Staphylococcus and Streptococcus act as what are called super antigens. They massively stimulate the immune system and the inflammatory reactions associated with that. But they're still forms of sepsis because they're caused by infection. Some forms of infection can actually drop the blood pressure at a relatively early stage in the infection. So you could get, even in an uncomplicated sepsis, the blood pressure could start to drop depending on the bacterial strain involved. If the bacterial strain is releasing toxins which are very vasodilatory, you could get some hypotension at a relatively early stage. But these are the surviving sepsis descriptions, therefore they're surviving sepsis campaign descriptions. It's an international campaign, so it's correct for us to use them. Uncomplicated, severe with organ involvement, septic shock when the tissues are no longer perfused, and of course profound hypotension will develop in time if that is not correctly managed. Now the next type of distributive shock, again largely caused by lack of vasomotor tone, is severe allergic reactions, anaphylaxis or anaphylactic shock. <clears throat> now here the body is exposed to an allergen, that is an antigen that the body is allergic to, and this antigen interacts with antibodies, and these antibodies are normally found on the surface of mast cells. Now, mast cells are present in many tissues of the body. They're almost certainly descended from basophils, from the blood. And the key thing about mast cells is they contain histamine and other inflammatory mediators. So when the allergen that's acting as an antigen binds onto the antibodies that are projecting from the mast cell, the combination of the antigen and the antibody stimulates the release of histamine and other inflammatory mediators. Now in a normal inflammatory reaction, this is supposed to happen in just a small part of the body to generate the clinical features of inflammation. The difference in an anaphylactic reaction is that you get mass activation of mast cells. So many millions of mast cells, I assume many millions, but mast cells all over the body are activated and start releasing histamine all at the same time. And this is rather analogous to giving the patient an intravenous bolus dose of histamine, not that we ever do such a thing, but that's what happens. The histamine in the blood goes up very sharply and very acutely. And histamine has two main effects. Histamine is vasodilatory, it will dilate the blood vessels, and of course that's going to reduce peripheral resistance, which is going to reduce blood pressure. But as well as that, there's often an effect on the lungs, because as well as being vasodilatory, histamine is also a bronchoconstrictor. It constricts the bronchial passages giving rise to essentially an acute asthmatic condition. And anaphylactic reactions can be caused by anything that the patient is sensitive to. It could be a common one in the UK here, for example, are uh, uh, nuts, peanuts particularly. Or it could be another relatively common one is shellfish, crabs, lobsters, different types of uh, shellfish um, that, that, that you can get. Um, it could be other things. Some people are allergic to strawberries. In the clinical situation, of course, it can be caused by vaccines or antibiotics or aspirin and other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are also well known to be capable of causing severe anaphylactic allergic reactions. And another one that's been reported more recently is latex because of course clinically we use quite a lot of latex, but it is possible to develop an allergy to latex. So mass release of histamine, massive vasodilation, loss of peripheral resistance, loss of blood pressure. And of course you probably realize now that if both of these conditions cause vasodilation, the patient's probably going to be red. And in anaphylaxis there's often, sometimes the patient goes red all over, sometimes there's just red patches. <clears throat> 
And it can be the same in, in toxic shock as well. Initially, the patient can, can be flushed. That, that, that there can be peripheral vasodilation. Often, the blood vessels to the hands and feet dilate, so the patient's feet feel warm. This is why these are sometimes described as hot shock, because there can be warm peripheries and warm skin in the early stages, at least, of the condition. And the last classification of distributive shock is neurogenic shock. Now, neuro is the nervous system, genic, <coughs> the term genic, always means beginning. So neurogenic shock begins with the nervous system. And as you probably already know, it's the sympathetic nervous system that is the fight or flight nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system is going to increase heart rate, increase cardiac output, increase respiratory rate, and the sympathetic nervous system also constricts the peripheral blood vessels. So increased sympathetic activity is going to increase blood pressure. Whereas the parasympathetic nervous system, as you probably know, is the, the rest day-to-day, -day, just getting by, digest food nervous system, the at-rest nervous system. So that tends to increase the blood flow to the gut. It will reduce heart rate. It will reduce stroke volume. Parasympathetic stimulation will reduce blood pressure. A neurogenic shock occurs whenever there's an imbalance between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic outflow <coughs> from the central nervous system. And in neurogenic shock, there's either going to be a decrease in the sympathetic outflow or an increase in the parasympathetic outflow. But either way, you're going to end up with too much parasympathetic and not enough sympathetic. That means the parasympathetic nervous system is going to predominate, therefore the blood pressure will be reduced. So, what can cause this? Well, one, one condition is spinal shock, if there's damage to the spinal cord. Now, the reason for this is that the sympathetic nerves leave the spinal cord from the nerve roots from T1, thoracic one, down to L3, down to the third lumbar nerves. So, all the way down the thoracic spine, <clears throat> and the first three lumbar nerves is the sympathetic outflow. So if there's damage to the spinal cord, the lower part of the sympathetic outflow is going to be lost because the sympathetic outflow will go down to the area of damage in the spinal cord <coughs> and then it will, um, it will stop, it won't go further down. So you're going to get reduced sympathetic outflow. But this doesn't really affect the parasympathetic nervous system so much because a lot of the parasympathetic nerves are cranial nerves. And the cranial nerves, the vagus nerve, for example, highly parasympathetic. <clears throat> and the cranial nerves, of course, communicate between the brain and the body, but they don't go, <coughs> sorry, they don't go via the spinal cord. So in spinal cord injuries, you can get disrupted sympathetic outflow, but not significantly disrupted parasympathetic outflow. And the patient's blood pressure can be low after a spinal cord injury, for a, few, for a few days or even a week or two, and they may need support. Um, after that, either the injury will resolve, if it's caused by bruising or pressure, or if there's permanent spinal cord injury, as unfortunately sometimes happens, then spinal reflexes will develop that can compensate for the lack of sympathetic outflow from the spinal cord. So spinal shock. <clears throat> People do sometimes use the term neurogenic and spinal shock interchangeably. It's wrong. Spinal shock is a subdivision of neurogenic shock. Vasovagal, fainting. Syncope means fainting. So if there's vasodilation, and if there is increased vagal activity, the vagus nerve is the tenth cranial nerve. There's two, obviously, one on either side. And it's parasympathetic. It's a parasympathetic nerve. <clears throat> so th this can occur in quite a variety of, of circumstances. Vasovagal syncope. For example, it can happen in pain. 
Now, I know in acute pain, if you stick a needle in someone, that's going to put the blood pressure up. But if that pain persists for an amount of time, then you can get a vasovagal response and the patient's blood pressure will go down. I was once injured uh, about a year ago and um, I was lying on a trolley for a few hours and then I decided I would try and get up. And as soon as I got up, I walked a few steps and because I was in a lot of pain, I just felt dizzy. I could feel myself going unconscious. It's a horrible feeling and I had to lie down on the floor. I was getting vasovagal syncope caused by pain in that instance. That's why it's very important, well, one reason, it's important to treat pain. So if a patient comes in with an unstable fracture, we can put a back slab on it to stabilise the fracture, we can give them some morphine to treat the pain, and the combination of stabilising the fracture and giving them the, um, the, the analgesic can mean that we take away this vasovagal effect and the patient will feel a lot better because their blood pressure is restored, because they no longer have this increased parasympathetic activity. <clears throat> and a subdivision of vasovagal syncope, I suppose, is psychogenic. Now, psycho means mind. This begins in the mind. So what seems to happen here <clears throat> is if we're in a situation that the mind finds intolerable, Sometimes that will generate a vasovagal response and the patient, the blood supply to their brain will just stop and they'll fall over, that they'll lie down because they're unconscious. But if they're unconscious, it means they're no longer in that difficult situation. And this can happen to us at work, especially when you're a student, you might be in a situation where you've never been in before, there's something that you find pretty horrible going on and uh, you can feel quite faint. Don't worry about it, lie down till it passes off. Um, very often you get used to it, and it, uh, indeed it can become routine. So psychogenic vasovagal. Now it's probably worth mentioning just another couple of le less common causes of distributive shock. And one is a, a systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So for example, in, uh, in severe uh, burns, if there's a lot of inflammation, or, or in pancreatitis where there's a lot of inflammation, then um, that can lead to a uh, release of a lot of inflammatory mediators and cytokines, which can dilate the blood vessels and again, lower the blood pressure. And another one bearing in mind, worth bearing in mind is Addisonian crisis, where there is a reduction in the amount of adrenal cortical steroid hormones in the blood, such as hydrocortisone. And the time I've seen this, is when a patient has been on steroid therapy, but stopped it all of a sudden, and then they go into this Addisonian crisis, and then you give them some intravenous hydrocortisone or give them a steroid replacement, and they recover from that quite quickly. But they're the six main causes of shock. So we've talked about the first one, hypovolemia, cardiogenic obstructive, and then the distributive shocks caused by reduced vasomotor tone, septic, allergic and neurogenic shock. So these are the main causes of shock. This is the way that shock is classified. So we need to recognize shock early, work out what sort of shock it is and treat it accordingly. And in the next section of this video, we're going to look at treatments.